Hi there guys, my name is Dr. Muhammad Khan. I am a specialist radiology registrar at the Northwest School of Radiology and I'm also a clinical medical education fellow for the School of Medicine at the University of Liverpool. Today I'll be giving you an introduction to chest x-rays and then covering some common pathologies that commonly crop up in clinical practice. So in terms of what we will be covering in this talk, the first thing is we'll understand why the chest x-ray is so important. What does a chest x-ray show? understand the chest x-ray labels, go through a normal chest x-ray, then give you a systematic approach that you can use when approaching any chest x-ray, and then finally put it all into practice through some very important clinical cases. And in terms of what we won't cover in today's lecture, first and foremost, we are going to talk about the detailed physics on chest x-rays, because often that can feel quite overwhelming. Secondly, the detailed chest x-ray anatomy, we're going to keep it quite simple. And then finally, the obscure pathology, because like I said, this is just an introduction to chest x-rays and we'll be covering the common pathologies you often see on the wards. So let's get started. Why is the chest x-ray so important in clinical practice? And in terms of why the chest x-ray is so important as a tool in clinical medicine is because often it will be you as the junior doctor who will be the first one to see the chest x-ray. Due to the advancement of technology, chest x-rays can be done very rapidly now, even by the bedside. And because of the workload for clinical radiologists, particularly for in terms of cross-sectional imaging, for example, CT or MRI imaging, clinical radiologists often don't get time to look at every chest x-ray that's done in the hospital. So often it's you as the junior doctor who will be the first one to see the findings of the chest x-ray. And more importantly, you as the junior doctor must be able to interpret and act on any emergency chest x-ray findings and we'll be discussing those in turn as we progress through this talk. So now that we understand the relevance and importance of a chest x-ray, now let's go through what a chest x-ray actually shows. And to make it as simple as possible, to make sure you don't have to go through any of the physics behind chest x-rays, you just need to remember that a chest x-ray shows the different densities of structures in the area that you are imaging and that's a fundamental principle of chest x-rays that you need to take away from this talk that chest x-rays show the different densities of structures that you are imaging and this is just a slide that reiterates the point I just made before that different structures have different densities and this is what fundamentally a chest x-ray shows and in terms of the relevance of densities when it comes to a chest x-ray here are three points I want you to embed into the back of your minds because this will make chest x-rays super simple. And that is fundamentally that the more dense an object is, the less x-rays that will pass through, meaning that on a chest x-ray, it will appear whiter. And the same is true for the opposite. So now let's take the converse. If you have an object that is less dense, okay, or has lesser density, then that will allow more x-rays to pass through it, meaning that on a chest x-ray, it will appear darker than the surrounding objects. So now let's bring this all together in terms of densities and what you see on a chest x-ray. So the reason why air appears black on a chest x-ray, it is because it is the least dense structure in the body, meaning that nearly all x-rays can pass through it, meaning that it appears black on a chest x-ray and as we go down the list as the density increases we then know why metal appears bright white because metal is an artificial structure often implanted into the body that is super dense meaning little to no x-rays can pass through it meaning that it appears bright white on a chest x-ray so once again just to reiterate the most relevant physics that you need to know for chest x-rays is the concept of densities, where an object that is less dense will allow more x-rays to pass through it, meaning that it appears black on an x-ray. And the more dense an object is, the less x-rays that can pass through it, meaning the whiter it will appear on the x-ray. So let's point to practice this concept of densities and the relevance it has to what you see on an x-ray. So in front of you, what you have is a right shoulder x-ray that also includes the right lung fields. So if we look at the least dense object, which will appear the darkest on an x-ray, that is the air in the right lung field. 
The reason why it appears the darkest or the blackest is because it is the least dense object, meaning that nearly all the x-rays can pass through it, meaning that it appears darker or blacker on an x-ray. And if we look at the right shoulder itself, you can see an extremely bright white object. And this is a metallic right shoulder replacement. And this appears whiter than the surrounding bone to it. And the reason why it appears brighter white compared to the surrounding bone is that the metallic implant is even more dense than the surrounding bone meaning that less x-rays can pass through it, meaning that it appears bright white on an x-ray. So now that we've gone through what a chest x-ray shows, now let's go through the labels that you'll often encounter on a chest x-ray and explain to you what they mean. Now with any test, whether it's a chest x-ray, whether it's looking at bloods, looking at cultures, etc. for any patient, there are three things you must do before you even start to interpret that chest x-ray or any imaging modality and that is number one you ensure that it is the right patient this is super critical number two you appreciate which side is the right side versus the left side now you may be thinking well dr khan we're in the 21st century now surely that isn't a problem but it can happen it does happen and you don't want to be the one that is caught out so look for the labels on the chest x-ray and then finally make sure you know what view it is and this is where the concept of a PA view versus an AP view comes into play and we'll explain this in the next slide and what you're looking at in front of you is a very normal chest x-ray but more importantly it shows you all the annotations that you need to be aware of when looking at a chest x-ray so the first one is patient information Often you will get the patient's name and date of birth and you need to make sure that this is the correct patient's identifiers. Then you will often find a little L or an R and this indicates that this side is the patient's left hand side and therefore that this side must be the patient's right hand side. Now sometimes the image can be inverted so please do look for this little L or little R to make sure you don't then go off incorrectly diagnosing pathologies that just don't exist. Number three, you will often see a PA or an AP. PA stands for posterior anterior view and AP stands for anterior posterior view. Okay, and we'll explain what the significance of that is in the next slide. And what you're seeing here is not just a fashion accessory. These are what we call nipple rings. Now the significance of the nipple rings is that in some patients, and in particular we're talking about female patients, they can often have dense areola regions which reside where the nipple is, and often this can incorrectly be thought of as pathology, and often they may be incorrectly thought of as lesions. So these nipple rings are used to denote where the nipple region is, so when the radiologist or any healthcare practitioner looks at them, and if there's any dense tissue at this site or any dense masses at this site, they can be like, okay, this may be just the nipple area. And of course, if there's any densities surrounding the nipple ring, then they could be a bit concerned saying, okay, maybe this is some pathology that we need to investigate further. So now let's look at the difference between a PA view and an AP view and why does it even matter? And fundamentally, the difference between an PA and an AP view is that they basically tell you the direction in which the x-rays travel through the patient. So if we take the PA view, the posterior anterior view, basically the x-rays have gone from the posterior to the anterior. And if we take the opposite, which is an AP view, an anterior posterior view, the x-rays have gone from the anterior of the patient to the patient's posterior. Okay, and that's simply what a PA and AP view stand for. And the reason why we care so much, whether it's a PA or an AP view film, is that it can affect the appearance of certain chest structures. And the most important one to bear note of is the heart, with the fact that an AP view can falsely enlarge the heart compared to a PA view. And this may give you a sense that there is cardiomegaly in the chest x-ray when actually there isn't. And that's why the gold standard x-ray view for a chest x-ray is a PA view. And what you're seeing in front of you basically summarizes the point I just made in the previous slide. 
This is the same patient, but a different view. On the left, you've got a PA view, and on the right, you've got an AP view. If you look at the AP view, you would say that this heart is grossly enlarged. But actually, if you look at the PA view on the left-hand side, it's actually within normal limits. So that's why you need to be very considerate of the type of view that you have, because an AP view can give you a false enlargement of the heart, thinking that you've got cardiomegaly, when in fact, it could just be incorrect and only due to the view that you have. So now that we've gone through the relevance of a chest x-ray, normal labels on a chest x-ray, now let's give you an overview of what a normal chest x-ray looks like. And if we go back to fundamentals, one of the things that I want to emphasize to you is that to understand pathology on a chest x-ray, you must understand normality. It's like with anything you do in medicine, before you learn disease, you must understand normal anatomy and normal physiology. The same applies to any imaging modality that you come across. And this is just a very simplified overview of the type of anatomy that you can appreciate on a chest x-ray. Now, I'm not going to go through it with you because I've annotated it very clearly. But just remember, the key is to embed this normal chest x-ray into your eyes, into your mind. So whenever you see another chest x-ray, you utilize this normal chest x-ray as a reference. So if anything on the other chest x-ray stands out, then you may be thinking, okay, is this some type of pathology that I need to then characterize further? Now that we've gone through what a normal chest x-ray looks like, one of the critical things that I want you guys to take away from this talk is to have a systematic approach to the chest x-ray, and that's what we're going to discuss now. And the best way I can explain why a system for chest x-rays is so important is because, think about it, when you're doing a respiratory exam, do you inspect, percuss, palpate and auscultate the lungs at the same time? Obviously you don't. You do it in a systematic manner. You start at the end of the bed and then work your way through it, starting with palpation, then percussion and then finally auscultation. You do it in a methodological manner. The same principles apply to a chest x-ray. In fact, they apply to any imaging modality that you come across. You must have a system. And without a system, this is what happens. Often when you open the chest x-ray or any imaging, you get overwhelmed with what the information is in front of you. Your eyes start basically darting here, there, everywhere. And basically you're hoping for something obvious to pop out to you and you're like, bang, I've got the diagnosis. But what if it doesn't? What if there isn't anything so obvious? What do you do then? Could you miss something because you haven't looked at the uh, chest x-ray in a systematic manner? And the best way to approach a chest x-ray is, like I said, with a systematic approach. You open the chest x-ray and rather than getting overwhelmed with what's in front of you, you start off by looking at a focused region and then working your way from one area to the next making sure you appreciate all the structures and trying to see if there's anything both subtle and obvious that's popping out at you. But by doing it in this methodical manner where you start off with the blue arrows, then the yellow arrows, then the green arrows, then the silver arrows, and so forth, your eyes are appreciating more detail in turn rather than just getting overwhelmed with the vast amount of information that a chest x-ray tells you. So now that we understand why a system is so important when looking at a chest x-ray, what system is best to use in your everyday clinical practice? And the reality of the situation is, is that there isn't one best system. There are many varieties and it's just whatever you prefer at the end of the day. So one is where individuals like to start in the center and then work their way out. Others like to start at the top of the chest x-ray and work their way down. This is often a very popular one amongst medical students, this A, B, C, D, E approach. A is airways, B is breathing, C is circulation, D is diaphragm, and E is everything else. The reason why airways is number one is because this is the thing that will kill you, just like you have in ALS where you do the A, B, C, D, E approach. You always check the airways first because the airway problems will kill the patient the quickest. Now, the most interesting one in the sense this is the one that we prefer and we'll explain why in the subsequent slides is this concept of are there many lung lesions and this stands for a abdomen 
T for thorax and soft tissues, M for mediastinum, N for looking at the lungs unilaterally, i.e. you look at the left lung and then the right lung, and then L for lungs bilaterally where you look at the left and right lung together. So you may be thinking, why am I recommending the Are There Many Lung Lesions system? The reason why is that it was devised by Benjamin Felsen, and for anyone that knows anything about chest x-rays, he is known as the godfather of chest x-rays. And realistically, if you're going to do chest x-rays properly, I would be the first to trust his methodology because it is the most systematic and, in my opinion, foolproof method to not miss anything on a chest x-ray. And that's why I'm recommending it to you guys. So let's start with A, which stands for abdomen. So when you're looking at the abdomen, which is the first thing you're going to look at and focus with in terms of where your eyes are looking at on the chest x-ray, you start in the right upper quadrant, which they've labeled here with the asterisk, and all you're doing is scanning across the upper abdomen on the chest x-ray. So looking just below the diaphragm on the right and on the left to ensure you've actually looked at the abdomen, which is also included on a chest x-ray. Okay, so A stands for abdomen, start to the right upper quadrant and scan across the upper abdomen. So now let's move on to the T, which stands for thorax and soft tissues. So you want to start at the right lung base, where it's shown here by the asterisk, and then across the right side, scan for the soft tissue, bone of the chest wall, ribs and the shoulder, up the right side, then across the center, and then down on the left. Remember, your eyes are just focusing on the soft tissues, the bones of the chest wall, the ribs and the shoulder. Do not look at anything else. Don't get overwhelmed by looking at the heart or the lungs. Just focus on the soft and the thorax itself. In particular, look at the axillary soft tissue folds where often pathology can appear hidden. Okay? It's, a very known, it's known as one of those uh, review areas where you look in the axilla to see if there's any soft tissue lesions. Okay? And now we move on to the M, which stands for the mediastinum. Now you're going to do this a bit differently than the abdomen and the thorax and the soft tissues because the mediastinum is a very congested area where there are a lot of structures and often they overlap so it can be a bit confusing and a bit daunting when you're looking at it for the first time. Okay, So you're going to look at the mediastinum in three focus sweeps. So the first sweep which is shown by A is you're going to focus on the trachea going down and the carina and the carina is where the trachea bifurcates into the right and the left side, okay? So that's the first sweep. Then you're going to do it again, this time with the uh, sweep B. And this time you're going to look specifically at the aorta coming down and also the heart as a structure by itself. And then finally, the last sweep, which is sweep C, is you're going to look at the hilum. And this is where the pulmonary vasculature merges, both on the right and the left-hand side, okay? Once again, you're going to do this in three sweeps, not all together. So A, look at the trachea and carina, where the trachea bifurcates. B, you're going to look at the aorta and the heart. And then the final sweep, you're going to look at the hilum on the right side and the left side in isolation. Now let's move on to the first L, which is to look at the lungs unilaterally. That means you look at the right lung in isolation and then the left lung in isolation, not together at the same time, okay? So what you do is you start at the right costophrenic angle and then you examine the right lung in isolation by scanning from the bottom up. Then once you reach the top, you then go over to the left lung and then scan the left lung coming down until you get to the left costophrenic angle. Once again, you look at the lungs unilaterally in isolation. And then finally, the last L, which stands for lungs bilaterally. So once again, start at the right costophrenic angle, but this time you're going to look at the right lung and then across to the left lung, then back to the right side, then to the left, right, left, right, all the way up till you reach the lung apices. So basically, you're looking at the lungs together from right to left and sweeping across both lung fields. And the reason why you're doing this is because the lungs are a paired structure. For example, there's a right and a left lung. So that means you can look for any symmetries and if there's any asymmetry. And if there is any asymmetry, then this would be concerning for any pathology that you then need to characterize further. 
So let's just recap the system that I've just described to you, which is the are there many lung lesions. So A stands for abdomen, T stands for thorax and soft tissues, M is for mediastinum, L is for lung unilaterally, and then L again looking at the lungs, this time bilaterally. Okay, so are there many lung lesions? This is probably one of the most systematic and thorough ways to look at any chest x-ray. So if you want, you can take a break here. I know we've gone through a lot of the foundational knowledge, but now this is where it gets exciting because now we can take the principles that we've learned in terms of densities, in terms of labels, in terms of how to systematically review a chest x-ray and let's put it into practice through clinical cases. And you've probably come across this saying time and time again, but I'm just going to reiterate it. When you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. Common things are common, and when it comes to interpretation of imaging and pathology on imaging, this principle applies, okay? Before you think of the weird and wonderful, think of the common and exclude that first. Okay, so this is what we're going to now emphasize through the cases that I'm going to show you. So this is the first case. 60-year-old male attends A&E, two-week history of productive cough, fever, generally feeling unwell. Examination notes that he's pyrexic, short of breath and having rigors. You've requested bloods and, of course, a chest x-ray. The bloods are going to take some time, but we've got a bedside chest x-ray, which was done very quickly, and that's available for you to view. A very classical case. You'll see this time and time again in A&E and something you'll encounter on a daily basis as a junior doctor. So if you need to, you can pause it here. But on the left-hand side of your screen is the patient's chest x-ray. And then on the right, what I've done to help you try and reinforce the concept of a normal chest x-ray, I've given you a reference chest x-ray that's perfectly normal, okay? Just to get this image embedded into your mind, okay? So if you want to pause it here, look at the chest x-ray, figure out what's wrong before you move on. So the three main questions for this case, case one, is what is the main chest x-ray finding? What is your clinical diagnosis based upon clinical history and also the radiological findings? And which lung lobe is affected based upon the image in front of you? So what is the main chest x-ray finding? Well, if you look on the right lung field, you can see what is clearly right middle lobe consolidation. And if you take that into context with the clinical history, with the fevers, the rigors, the fact that the patient is generally unwell, productive cough, this would be indicative of pneumonia within the right middle lung lobe. And finally, which lung lobe is affected? This is the right middle lobe. And now you may be thinking, well, Dr. Khan, how did you go that one step further and actually tell me exactly what lung lobe it was in. And there's two concepts for you to be aware of to accurately do this. The first is the anatomy of the lung lobes. And secondly is the concept of the silhouette sign, which I'll now go on to explain. So if we start with the anatomy of the lung lobes, the right lung has three lobes. The right upper lobe, the right middle lobe, and the right lower lobe. In contrast, the left lung only has two lobes the left upper lobe and the left lower lobe or more correctly denoted as the left lingual lobe. Okay, so just to confirm, the right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two lobes. And fundamentally, the silhouette sign states that when you have things or structures of the same density that are adjacent, this is critical, they're adjacent, they're side by side, they cannot be differentiated by x-ray. Instead, you get a blurred border or a loss of border on the x-ray as the two areas overlap. And you may be thinking, well, why do you get a loss of border? Remember, x-rays, whether it's a chest x-ray or abdominal x-ray, show you the different densities of the structures being imaged. When the structures have the same density, that means the same amount or relative amount of x-rays that can pass through it will be the same meaning that it will appear the similar density, i.e. the same darkness or whiteness on a chest x-ray, meaning it's very difficult to distinguish when one structure ends and another structure begins. So let's put into practice our knowledge of the lung lobe anatomy and the silhouette sign. So if we start off with loss of the upper right heart border and the border of the ascending aorta, 
as you can see by this yellow arrow, then this would indicate that there's a pathology in the right upper lobe. If, we, however, we lose the border of the right heart side, then this would indicate that the pathology is in the right middle lobe. And finally, if we have a loss of the right hemidiaphragm border, then this would indicate that the pathology is in the right lower lobe. Similarly, if we lose the border of the left hemidiaphragm, then this would indicate that the pathology is in the left lingual lobe. And this is also the case if you have loss of the left heart border. Once again, this would indicate that the pathology is in the left lingual lobe. So, let's put into practice what we just learnt about the lung lobe anatomy and the silhouette sign. So, once again, if you want to pause this, by all means do so. But I want you to answer the two questions. Number one, which border has been lost in this chest x-ray and which lung lobe is affected? So, question one, which border has been lost? Well, it's clear that the left heart border has been lost. What you can see is the heart... And then it becomes very hard to distinguish where the heart stops because you've got this other region of what is clear consolidation. But because the densities are the same and they're adjacent to it, you get the silhouette sign, which is a loss of the borders between adjacent structures of the same densities. And moving on to question two, which lung lobe is affected? Well, as we said in the previous slide, a loss of the left heart border would indicate that in this case, the consolidation is in the lingual lobe of the left lung. Now let's move on to case two. We have a 32-year-old female brought in by ambulance. She's been in a high-speed road traffic accident. She was the passenger, unfortunately. She's alert. She's got a GCS, a Glasgow Coma Scale of 14 out of 15, but she's got marked bruising over her chest wall and she's profoundly short of breath. On examination, you note that she's hypoxic, tachypneic, she's cyanosed, and she's got a prominent silent chest on the left-hand side. So once again, like I did for case one, on the left-hand side, you've got the patient's chest x-ray, and on the right, you've got the normal for reference. Like I said, and I'm going to reiterate it with every case, get the normal chest x-ray ingrained into your head, burn it into your mind, because that is the thing you're going to reference to time and time again to spot any pathology. So the three questions for this case are what are the main chest x-ray findings, what is your clinical diagnosis, and what is your immediate management. So if you want to pause it, write your answers before you move on. So what are the main chest x-ray findings? Well, the first one is that you have a loss of lung markings on the left-hand side in the peripheries. So what I want you to do is look in between the ribs here. It's very, very dark. But what you see here is like it's basically black. But when you look on the inner aspects of the left lung field, you see all these lung markings, which are the vessels in the actual left side of the lung. But you see they reach a point, it comes to a point, there's this line, which we'll go on to, and then it just stops. Where do all the lung markings go? So there's a loss of lung markings on the periphery of the left lung field. But more importantly, you see this visible pleural edge running down the left hand side okay and this should give the game away but let's see if there's any more signs of this chest x-ray and there is this is a very alarming feature and if you see this you need to be acting quick time and that there is trachea deviation to the right hand side look if you follow the tra trachea down it comes down center 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 boom it's swinging to the right hand side okay so what is your clinical diagnosis left-sided tension pneumothorax they should be ringing an alarm bells what is the immediate management it's a needle thoracostomy second intercostal space mid clavicular line just to let you know tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis not a radiological one okay so this should have been diagnosed even before the chest x-ray was taken but i've just put it in to exemplify the chest x-ray findings of a pneumothorax to you guys so now let's go through the three radiological features of pneumothorax. So the first one is a visible visceral pleural edge, which is this thin, sharp white line. Two, you'll see no lung markings peripheral to this line. And finally, the peripheral space will appear darker than the adjacent lung. And that's because the peripheral space only contains air. And like what we said about air, it's not dense whatsoever. 
nearly all the x-rays pass through it so it appears dark on an x-ray. So now you may be asking, well, when does pneumothorax become a tension pneumothorax? And there's four critical features that you need to be aware of radiologically. The first one is mediastinal shift to the opposite side of the tension, okay? So in the previous case, the tension pneumothorax was on the left-hand side and the mediastinal shift was to the right. Number two, you get increased intercostal spaces on the same side of the tension and I'll show this to you in a subsequent case. Number three, you get depression of the hemidiaphragm on the same side of the tension and then four, you get something known as the deep sulcus sign, once again on the same side of the tension. So three signs on the same side of the tension and one sign on the opposite side of the tension. So now let's show you some of those radiological signs in clinical practice. On the left side of your screen, you have a left tension pneumothorax, and on the right side of your screen, you have a right tension pneumothorax. I'm sure you guys all picked up on that. So the first thing to note is that we have three signs on the same side of the tension and one side on the opposite side of the tension pneumothorax. So if we look at the left tension pneumothorax, what you can see is that tr trachea comes down, 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 but it's shifted to the right side of the body. In fact, if you look at the heart, it's pretty much on the right side of the chest. This shows the mediastinal shift to the right side of the body, opposite to the side of the tension pneumothorax. Secondly, if you look at the space in between the intercostal ribs, you can see that these are larger than if you look on the opposite side, okay? And the reason why is because of the increased air that's collating on the left-hand side of the lung. It's forcing the ribs to basically push apart, okay? Then look at the hemidiaphragm. This left hemidiaphragm is a lot more pushed down than the right on the opposite side, okay? And you can't see the deep sulcus sign on this chest x-ray very well. I've got a separate one that shows it very nicely. Now, if we look on the opposite side, once again, look at the trachea. I think it's all the way over here. And look at the heart. It's basically on the left uh, side of the lungs. Look at the ribs. These are much larger than the opposite side. And once again, look at the hemidiaphragm. This is pushed down compared to this one, okay? So these are the radiological features of a tension pneumothorax. And I've put this chest x-ray in because it nicely shows you the deep sulcus sign, which is indicated by this red arrow. If you look at the costrophrenic angle here, it is a lot more depressed than the one on the opposite side. And this is because this is the side of the tension pneumothorax and air is now pocketing in the costrophrenic angle, making it appear deeper than the opposite side. Now let's move on to case three. You have a 44 year old male brought in by the paramedics. He's noting vague symptoms, complaining of abdominal pain, some vomiting, he's out of breath. You know he's a smoker based upon his prior admission. And on examination today, he's got vague lower thoracic upper abdominal pain, tachycardic, tachypneic, mildly hypotensive. And you're a bit unsure whether this is a chest or abdominal problem. But because you know you can get it done very quickly, you order a chest x-ray to try and rule out any uh, chest pathology. And like with every other case, the patient's chest x-ray is on the left-hand side and the normal one for reference is on the right-hand side. So the three main questions I want you to ask for this chest x-ray, and by all means do pause it and answer them before you move on. What is the main chest x-ray finding? What is your clinical diagnosis or your clinical suspicion? And what are your immediate next steps based upon what you've seen on this chest x-ray? Well, in terms of what the main chest x-ray finding is, I'm sure you all spotted that there's air below the right hemidiaphragm. And if you'd been using the are there many lung lesions a systematic approach, you would have spotted this straight away because you would have looked at the abdomen and spotted this air just below the right hemidiaphragm. In terms of the clinical diagnosis, you can't be like, okay, so this is a case of X, Y, and Z. 
But what you can say with confidence is that this is pneumoperitoneum secondary to a likely abdominal perforation. And in terms of the next steps, you need to get your senior involved quick because this patient will need an urgent CT abdomen if they're, if they're fit and well enough for scanning. And the reason why we're not doing an abdominal x-ray is because the abdominal x-ray, once again, is not the best indication of why there is an abdominal perforation. It will just show the free pocket of air underneath the right hemidiaphragm, but it won't tell you why. That's why we would go straight to CT, of course, after discussing with your senior and discussing with your friendly radiologist. And the main reason why I put that case in was to emphasize to always look below the diaphragm. Yes, a chest x-ray gives you more information about the chest, but the upper abdomen is included. And if you don't look, you will miss pathologies. That's why we recommend the are there many lung lesions systematic approach because it forces you to look at the abdomen first and foremost. Now moving on to case four, we've got a 67 year old female brought in after referral from her GP. She came to her GP feeling short of breath, worsening over the last two to three weeks. She just doesn't feel herself. She says she has difficulty walking, very breathless on minimal exertion. She's a known smoker. She's on a drug called Evabra something, but she doesn't remember and you don't have a GP notes with her. And examination notes that she's hypoxic, tachycardic, breathless on exam. She's got crepitations throughout her lung fields and she's got marked peripheral edema. And you note that on palpation, she's got a pacemaker inserted. Once again, the patient's chest x-ray is on the left and the normal one for reference is on your right. And the two main questions I want you guys to answer, and please do pause before you move on. What are the main chest x-ray findings and what is your clinical diagnosis based upon the history and the radiological findings that you can see in front of you? Well, in terms of the main chest x-ray findings, there's three predominant ones. Yes, I'll give you brownie points if you spotted the pacemaker. And the key with any pacemaker is that you need to follow the leads to number one, make sure they're intact but also to make sure that they're in the right place. And this one is in the right place. Okay, so that's the first thing. And yep, I'll give you brownie points if you looked at the pacemaker and you made sure that the leads were intact. Now moving on, this is a PA view. So you can assess the heart correctly. And what you note is that the cardiothoracic ratio is greater than 50%, meaning that the heart is enlarged, this cardiomegaly. Also, you note that there's congestion around the hyalur region, known as perihyalur congestion. This is indicated by the yellow line. And then finally, what you note is that the upper blood vessels in both lung fields are dilated and engorged. Okay, So when you take this together in the context of her clinical history and the radiological findings, this is indicative of pulmonary edema, secondary to heart failure. And what we'll move on to now is the A, B, C, D, E radiological features of heart failure and we'll go through them in turn. So let's start off with A, which stands for alveolar edema, otherwise described as these bat wings, okay? So what you see here is fluid leakage into the alveoli and they give this characteristic bat wing appearance, that's why they call bat wings, okay? but it's alveolar edema and simply it refers to fluid leakage into the alveoli. B stands for septal B lines or Curly B lines and the reason why they're called Curly B lines is because they were named after Peter Curly who was an Irish radiologist. There's two features that help you know that this is a septal B line, okay? The first is that they're always peripheral to the lung fields, okay? So here they are, here's one, here's another down here. They're always on the periphery of the lung field, never central, okay? If you see one here, this isn't a septal B line, okay? It's something else. And number two, it appears longitudinal to the lateral lung border. And you can see this here with the orange. It's always longitudinal, okay? So two features, always on the periphery of the lung field and always longitudinal. And what the septal B line represents is that it represents lymph vessels who are taking fluid back into circulation. But because of the fluid overload, there's congestion in the lymph vessels, making them prominent, okay? You should never see septal B lines in a normal 
chest x-ray and if you look on the left hand side of your screen you can't see any on this normal chest x-ray. C stands for cardiomegaly which is defined as a cardiothoracic ratio greater than 50% okay. So how is it calculated? Well it's the ratio of the widest diameter of the heart indicated by the orange arrow to the widest diameter of the lung cavity indicated by the blue arrow and the key thing to take away once again is that you can't calculate it on an AP view because it will give you a false sense of enlargement. Remember, this is why we prefer PA views over AP views. D stands for dilated upper lobe vessels and basically with the blue arrows what you can see are these dilated upper lobe blood vessels and basically what it's telling you is that there's been redistribution of blood flow from the lower lobe towards the upper lobe because there is this congestion in the vasculature causing this redistribution okay so D stands for dilated upper lobe vessels and finally E stands for pleural effusion and basically pleural effusion refers to fluid in the pleural space as you can see here by this blue arrow you get a meniscus at the costrophenic angle which you can see here and to get this appearance on a chest x-ray you typically need around 300 mils of fluid before you can actually recognize a pleural effusion on a chest x-ray. Finally, case 5. It's 3 a.m., you're shattered, you get a bleep. It's the nurse from the gastro ward. She tells you that someone's NG tube, nasogastric tube, has fallen out and the nurse has kindly put it back in for you but now, as per hospital policy, you need to do a nasogastric check. You sigh, you think to yourself, I really hope I remember Dr. Khan's talk. This is a classical case that happens time and time again when you're the F1 and the F2. So you need to be ready to be able to do NG tube checks via chest x-ray. Like with every other case, the patient's NG tube is shown on the chest x-ray on the left hand side. And the normal, which I hope is now in the back of your head, ingrained there for life, for all your clinical practice, is on the right hand side of your screen. And the three main questions I want you to answer with this chest x-ray is, number one, what is the main chest x-ray finding? Number two, do you think it's okay to pass the feed through the NG tube? The nurse is waiting for your approval or for your justification why we can't use it. And then number three, what are your next steps? Well, I'm sure all of us got this, but let's go through it. What is the main chest x-ray finding? Well, let's follow the NG tube down. Well, it starts off good, it's in the center, it's in the center. What's going on here? Okay, it's done a loop-de-loop. -loop. All right, and now, okay, that's not good. It's in the right main bronchus, not where it's supposed to be. So, now that you know this, do you reckon we can pass feed through it? Nope, not at all, not whatsoever. Passing feed through an incorrect NG tube placed is a never event, i.e. it should never occur, and it's a big clinical incident, and this is can lead to patient death, so it should never happen. And what are the next steps? You need to reposition this NG tube, i.e. you need to pull it back, try again, and then critically reconfirm, okay, before you even use it. And you think, okay, I've repositioned it, it'll be fine now. Nope. You need to take, an, take another test, whether it's through a pH test or another chest x-ray, to make sure it's in the right place. And that is guided by your local uh, hospital policy as to what they recommend in terms of uh, correctly identifying if the NG tube is in the right place. And to help you make sure that you correctly identify the correct position of an NG tube, with every NG tube you may do, we have a five-point checklist that you should utilize for every NG tube check. So the first question you ask is, does the NG tube pass vertically down the midline or near the midline? If it does, you're on to a good start. If it doesn't, you need to restart the NG tube placement. Question number two, does the NG tube follow the course of any main bronchus below the carina? The carina is when the trachea splits into the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. Now, if you start to see the NG tube start to swing to one side into the lung, it most likely indicates that it's in one of the bronchus. Okay, so you need to withdraw the NG tube and start again. Question number three, is the NG tube in the midline 
as I'm drawing until the diaphragm where it crosses the gastroesophageal junction. If it does, your NG tube most likely is in the esophagus and it's going down the right way into the stomach, okay? If it doesn't and it starts to deviate again into the lung fields, you're in the wrong spot, you need to restart. Question number four, is the NG tube tip visible at least 10 centimeters below the gastroesophageal junction? This is to ensure that the NG tube isn't just sitting at the gastroesophageal junction, but it's actually sufficiently within the stomach, okay? And then finally, is the NG tip included in the x-ray? Now, the NG tube tip is typically radio-opaque, meaning it appears on a chest x-ray. The reason why you want to be able to visualize the tube tip is so you know where the NG tube ends. Because sometimes you can advance it too far and it ends up in an incorrect position or too far into like maybe even the duodenum. So you need to be able to know where the NG tube tip is. So let's take those principles that we've just learned and now apply it to this case. So question number one, does the NG tube pass vertically down the midline or near the midline? Yep, it does, so we're on to a good start. Question number two, does the NG tube follow the course of any main bronchus? Well, if I follow the trachea, I can see one of the bronchus here. It's not following that. And I can briefly make out the left main bronchus. Nope, it goes down. So, yep, it's doing good. Question number three, is the NG tube in the midline until the diaphragm where it crosses the gastroesophageal junction? Yep, here's the gastroesophageal junction. It passes it through. Fantastic. Question number four, is the NG tube tip visible at least 10 centimeters below the gastroesophageal junction? Yep, it is. So that's on to a good. We've got four out of five so far. And then finally, is the NG tip included? Yep, it is. This radio opaque bit of the NG tube, it's included. This NG tube is in the right position. You can use it. Fantastic. Here are the references of the cases I used in this talk. So thank you for listening. Like I said, this is an introduction talk and I've covered the foundational knowledge when it comes to chest x-rays. In particular, the systematic approach, which will help you look at any chest x-ray in the future. The cases that we've done may appear very simple, but these are the common cases that you will encounter in clinical practice. So if you can nail those, then you'll be in good stead for your future practice going forward. Thank you again for listening, guys, and see you later.